Okay, so season two predictions. Let's start out small. Let's start out with just a little humble prediction. Just a peaceful, small, fun, little predicky wiki. But like, actually, this is the prediction. So let me explain. We got to start with kind of a meta prediction. This interview, probably the most important interview when it comes to season two. They actually just say exactly what happens. What can you tell us about season two? What can we expect from the gang? Can you give us any insight into what we can expect the uh, focus to be on? Well, uh, everyone dies in the first five minutes. And that's it for the video. Subscribe. Thanks for watching. Okay, no. So here's what they said. Right now, we're focusing more on following up what you saw in season one. Tell the story and hopefully wrap it up with a great ending and go further. We started a story that we're really passionate about and that we want to see through. There's so many characters in our IP, so many things you keep thinking about, keep toying with over the years that you want to explore. So there's a lot we want to do. We want to find ways to be able to bring stories for players for more champions and get to see more parts of the world. So this is super important. So first and foremost, it's telling us some very important things that Arcane is not going to be. Let's start with that. Arcane will not be 10 seasons of Jinx Vi Piltover Zon. Which, by the way, I totally watched. Love the characters, love the setting, of course. Could watch forever. But either way, not what Arcane will be. Arcane will also not be a slow expanding build up to bigger stories. This isn't like the epic fantasy or shonen anime type structure, where we start with a story with a limited scope and gradually expand those initial characters' stories to encompass more and more of the world until we're fighting for like the fate of humanity. Nope, season two will be the concluding half of the story we started in season one. That story will end decisively, and then we're moving on. New part of the world, new characters, new storylines. And the implication it seems is that the show will continue this way in future seasons as well. Couple seasons in this place with these characters, move on. New place, new characters, spend two or three seasons here, move on, and so on. And it won't be completely separate, we probably will get the MCU type meta plot. We'll get the slow build up with a lot of individual threads that won't seem necessarily so connected until we start seeing crossovers. We're like in Bilgewater and oh my god, what's that neon monkey tag on the wall? It's Jinx here. Threads we thought were separate will converge, building up into a big overarching meta plot. Something like each star in each area relates to the political situation with Noxian imperialism, and the final season is like a Marine Ford or Avengers Endgame-esque battle of all of Runeterra versus Noxus. Or we get something more magic god void related, something like that. Now the reason why this is the most important fact to get clear when it comes to predictions about season 2 specifically is that this general structure itself becomes a huge source of information about the specifics of next season. About what happens, how the arcs play out. Most prediction stuff I've seen is based on the mix of lore, hints dropped in season 1, and actual info we've been given in like interviews and teasers, and we'll get into that. But I think much more importantly we're being told here that in season 2 we'll see resolutions to every character arc. So that tells us a ton. We can look at the characters, see where they're at, see what is unresolved, and use that to determine what must happen in this season. So, for example, Warwick's resolution has to be saving Vi. And yeah, Warwick Vander, been talked about a lot. For those who aren't familiar, Warwick, Chemtechy, werewolfy creation of Singe. We see it hanging here, mirroring this art. Vander, called Hound of the Underworld, called a lapdog by Silco. Seems like Vander survived and was made to Warwick by Singe. But the important thing here is that we can clearly see that this form of this character is a continuation of the arc we're already familiar with. This is directly following Vander's arc. Vander is consistently throughout every scene he's in at war with his own tendency for violence. He has to fight his inner monstrousness to accomplish his goal of protecting his people, his family. So what's season 2 coming to do here? We're in the same unresolved conflict, Vander versus the inner monster, but now it's gotten worse. Vander is an outer monster as well. It is a new form of the same conflict, a new stage of the conflict. He had the potential for violence, now he embodies violence. The mindlessness we feel when we're in rage, which we see him fight against in season 1, that's now his natural state. That mindlessness is who he is now. It hasn't just consumed his state of mind, it's consumed his identity. But it's still what he needs to overcome. As bad as it is, he still needs to find whatever small part of Vander, whatever tiny sliver of that identity of the peace-loving father that still exists somewhere in there, and fight all the wolfiness and do what? Protect his children, same as before. So that I think is the building blocks of Warwick season 2 are his struggle is finding his identity from within the monster. Starting point, Monster Warwick hurting things, being violent. Ending point, Vander Warwick protecting things, protecting his children. And I do think that has to be the ending point. It has to be his climax, it's been said as his goal from his first scene, and when he left his identity of violence, it was to become a father. The show was setting up two mutually exclusive identities. Now his identity is violence again in a new way, and he has to make that switch again. And also, it's the one thing that we just want to see as the audience. So it's the one thing that started will keep us from seeing until the very end. Or, I should say, it's one of the two things we want to see. The other I could see going either way. The other thing they're setting up for here is a big reveal. If you're making a character with a secret identity, you're telling us that there's going to be a big moment where we get that release, that emotional discovery of who he is. So the question there, when is that going to be?
be. So either it is going to coincide with the climax, either Vi finds out Warwick is Vander as he's saving her. So he's like rewarded his identity back through Vi's realization, almost like he's earning it with his actions. Or Vi learns he's Vander at the end of like act two, and then we have to watch her living with this painful knowledge for a few episodes until the end. And showing her pain, this so close but yet so far chance she has to rekindle her most precious relationship, that would be used as something to up the stakes for his resolution. Okay, so now there's one last detail here with Warwick, but we need to talk about something else first. So let's put a pin in this puppy and talk about this. Every way I slice it, if I go after your sister alone, one of us comes back in a box. I can do this myself. No one else needs to get hurt. I'm glad it's you. Had to be you. This is telling us a lot. There's actually a ton we can derive from it. I want to get really, really specific, go line by line. And I want to talk about the second line first. I can do this myself. No one else needs to get hurt. No one else needs to get hurt. What must you say here? Someone already got hurt. I can do this myself. And Vi is crying, which is surprising. We barely see her get emotional like that at all in season one. Something seriously awful must have happened. So again, what must you say here? Well, Vi only really cares about a few people in her life. So I only see three possibilities. Either Kate got seriously hurt, Echo got seriously hurt, or it's some new character she forms a bond with in the first half of season two, either someone completely new, or someone she just hasn't interacted with much or at all, like Jace or Victor. Is Jinx a possibility? No, I don't think so. They're talking about going after Jinx here, so it wouldn't make much sense for Vi to be talking about her. What about other random Undercity people? We already got a taste of that with Vi and Jace in the Shimmer Factory. It seemed like her response to that was not to get more emotional, but to just let that make her more determined. So I don't think it's that. Maybe if Jinx destroyed enough of the Undercity, but no, I think it's a specific person who gets hurt. And the only other possibility I can think of is Vander, which for reasons we'll discuss, I also don't think is likely. Okay, next line. If I go after your sister alone? Go after, what does that mean? So I think you can only say two possibilities. One, Jinx is somewhere this season, like somewhere specific. Or two, she's like on her way somewhere maybe, or on some kind of mission. Either way, she's somewhere or following her takes us somewhere with limited access for some reason. Why else would there be a question of who goes after Jinx? Everyone should go after her. But no, apparently it's limited who goes after her. To me, it seems most likely that this has to do with the nature of the place itself. It's some kind of limitation on how many people can get there. That I think fits best with the rest of it. I'm glad it's you. Had to be you. Jinx expects her opposition to be limited in this way. She expects only one person to get to her, or to be able to get to her, something like that. And then what about this? Every way I slice it. This isn't a general impression Kate has. Every way she slices it, this isn't a guess, it's not expressing a fear, it's a calculation. Kate is trying to figure out how to go after Jinx. Which also, by the way, means that something has changed drastically with Jinx. Because in season one, they were going after her without this dilemma. So now she's leveled up somehow. She has a weapon or some new advantage. And one of us comes back in a box, not both of us. Okay, so let's put this all together. What do you get? So here's the jump. Are you ready? This is where it gets kind of speculative. I'm like 50-50 on it. Just because A, it's so specific, and B, I don't know if I'm reading too much into a line or into a pair of lines. And to preface, this is all in the context of what? Of this. Of this triumphant but also traumatic moment for her. And it's not just a moment where something changed internally for her, it's a moment where her outer world changed entirely. Jinx found herself, but she lost everyone else in her world. Her father is dead, again, and she's rejected her sister. There isn't anyone else she has any sort of relationship with whatsoever. We know Jinx tends to turn inward in unhealthy ways when she's suffering. She retreats. Sometimes we even see attempts to escape. And she has just been through a triumph also. So we also need to see Jinx empowered in a way we've never seen her before. So what the heck does that look like? What does it look like to suffer and retreat further inward into solitude while also being empowered? Okay, so this line definitely is foreshadowing something. There is zero chance that by the time Arcane is taken off the airwaves, we don't see Jinx in the sky. Is it foreshadowing this season specifically? That's a toss-up. We don't know, we can though. This could very well be a hint at how Jinx eventually maneuvers herself for a crossover of some kind in like season 43 of Arcane, we can only hope. But, or this is foreshadowing Jinx having a power moment in a sense and also retreating in a sense. Putting herself in this position that's threatening, but also where it's hard for people to reach her. And that is my prediction here. Jinx creates a death ship of doom, menacingly circles Piltover. Someone needs to go up and stop her, but how can you reach a single airship while it's in the sky? You need some kind of smaller vessel to be able to board it. And meanwhile, Jinx is just up there with Pow Pow gunning down anyone who gets close. So your options are you can shoot the whole ship out of the sky, or you can confront Jinx. So that's the situation, and then what happens? Well, what's the other line? One day, I'm gonna ride in one of those things. And one day, I'm gonna shoot one of them down.
remember what Milo represents, she is called Jinx, and this is like her Jinx representation, that destructive voice within her saying this IRL in the same breath as non-destructive Jinx says she wants to ride one. So what's gonna happen? I think Vi goes after her, we see the big epic fight between the sisters that we've been waiting and waiting to see, and like everything Jinx is involved in, big boom, self-destructs, agony, trauma. But we do hear one more thing in this teaser that's about the Jinx Vi conflict. Okay, now time to remove the staple from our puppy. Let's bring him back into the discussion. And we gotta talk about Vi and Kate's arcs too here. This whole thing never got resolved. We had this scene and then they were back together, but you know, being kidnapped by the same person doesn't solve fundamental questions about how society works. So the central conflict between these two characters season two is gonna be the same as the conflict in season one, but again, different form. Now put a lore alert here, we know Vi's final form, so to speak. Vi becomes an enforcer along with Kate. She is heading in that direction already. She's really Realizing A, that saving Jinx involves tackling much bigger societal issues, and B, that if her real loyalties lie with the people of the Undercity, then she has to even sacrifice and betray that part of her identity in order to help them. So in both of these ways, she is growing more distant from her sister. Practically, she's going to be less direct in reaching her, and it's going to involve caring about greater concerns, and also it's going to involve her becoming something that's anathema to Jinx, becoming the worst thing. And meanwhile, Savika was right. It's not what you think. She's with some girl enforcer. Guess she replaced you. Despite this being played off in season one as kind of a hallucination, it is real. She's growing closer and closer to this person, may even come to love her, which means that Jinx isn't the only object of love in Vi's world anymore, more distancing from her sister. And Vi is gonna struggle with all of this, but in this final battle, we're gonna see her at her most distant. We're gonna be seeing the Piltover Enforcer fighting the Zonite terrorist. It's gonna be very different from the Tea Party, where we really did see them as sisters. There's so much more going on now, so much more at stake, so many more priorities. Vi's life has expanded outwards. Jinx his life has retreated inwards, and this misalignment means that the story will essentially be punishing them thematically for forgetting that they're sisters, engaging this lose-lose fight that will result in the Hindenburg disaster and their ultimate demise unless they have some way of simultaneously being saved, being reminded that they're family, and getting a lesson about lose-lose situations and violence. Enter Doggy. Saving either both of them and reminding them of this, or Jinx is hopeless, we just save Vi. Vi had the strong relationship with Vander anyway. Either way, getting that moment of resolving all the arcs at once. So that's how I think it's gonna go. Sisters grow apart, Vi's an enforcer, Jinx in her airship of doom, big epic fight, Hindenburg, Vander saves them and reminds them that Ohana means family. Okay, now while all this is going on, we got Piltover versus Zahn, and probably Piltover versus Noxus, so let's talk about that. Jace, Victor, Mel, prepare for a heartbreak, that is my prediction here. The season ended with these three characters on the same side making the moral decision and then getting punished for it. And they were in three very different positions when they got to this point in their arcs. And I think we can look at those differences in the context of what we know about these characters' personalities to predict how they're going to react to this whole thing blowing up in their face. And long story short, my prediction is that we're going to see a really messy breakup between all three. Jace is going to become the Warhawk. This is just the pattern of how he reacts to everything. Whenever he is wrong about something, he he picks up and sprints in the other direction. Turning the energy down didn't work, gotta crank it. Time to crank it. Economic solution didn't work, time for violence. Violence didn't work, time for sudden peace treaty. And now that doesn't work, so he has to go back in the other direction again. Except this time it's gonna be much worse, because think about how he did develop in the end. With respect, I don't give a shit what any of you think of me anymore. Up until now, we saw Jace's impulsivity and arrogance tempered by two things. He was inclined to go along with society's rules unless someone else urged him not to. He was always waiting for someone to give him permission, whether it was about developing Hextech or developing Hextech weapons. And the second thing, he also did seem to recognize his lack of experience, at least for part of last season. And now he's no longer inexperienced and he is no longer waiting for permission. He no longer cares at all about society's evaluation of him. So Jace is poised to do the Jace flip-flop. There's not a lot riding on this peace decision specifically for him. Compare that to Mel, her development was all about choosing peace specifically. That is what differentiates her from her family. And that is a separate thing from whether peace works in this particular instance or not. It's not like now she sees it didn't work, she's gonna run to best and be mommy's favorite now. No, she took off that ring. She cannot undo that by choosing war again. Or to hedge a little bit, at least not choosing it in the way Ambessa wants her to. She will not become the wolf. But what will she become? Well, she's only started to build her own path. She took that first step of casting off what defined her before. Now she has 
has to figure out how to make that work. I think that would be her arc. She'll be juggling Piltover and Zahn and whatever happened to her brother, whatever we see with Noxus. She'll be urged towards violence from Jace and from her mother, and we're gonna see confusion for the first time with Mel. We're gonna see her being lost because she's ventured into completely unfamiliar waters. She has no idea how to be this new person. She's gonna have to find that within herself, but the whole time she's gonna refuse to become the wolf. That is a matter of principle for her. And then Victor, it's interesting. It's a matter of principle for him too, and it's also a matter of identity. Victor is a Zaunite. Jace Victor shippers prepare for a rough season. If Jace leads Piltover to war against Zaun, that is the end of Jace and Victor's bond. Victor has never stood for violence. He's already been moving towards Zaun with the drugs and the body modification and the low self-esteem. The only thing that had been keeping him in Piltover was his relationships, and he's running out of those. Heimerdinger, that's done. Sky, that's done. Jace, done if he ends up choosing more. And the only other character Victor has a relationship with is Singed. So that is the natural destination for him. We're going to see Victor unleashed under Singe, not the Victor Heimerdinger would have wanted to see, but the Victor Singe had hoped to mentor. And Victor's purpose once he's in the Undercity will be the same selfless purpose we've always seen with him. He'll be trying to use his technology to help people, this time helping poor sick Zonites modify their bodies with a hex core, just like he'll do to himself, and I think people who know lore know where that's going. And that's kind of the next big question here, how does this become this? Of all the characters in Arcane besides Warwick now, I suppose, Victor is the furthest from his lol form. And season one, he doesn't seem to make that much progress in getting there, right? Which means we need to see a lot of change in season two. But no, actually, I think we see him move further along that road than it appears. There are five unresolved progressions that they start in season one towards a glorious evolution, Victor. Number one, Victor is wasting away both physically and mentally. He's dying still, obviously, that was unresolved. But his self worth, which was always low, his identity is also deteriorating. We lost ourselves. Number two, we see that the hex score consistently gets stronger as a result of Victor's giving over of himself, his blood, his relationships, his virtue. So combining these two progressions we have so far, we get this picture of Victor's body becoming less valuable to give up as his self-worth also wastes away, as he cares less about giving up his soul and who he is. That feeds perfectly into what the hex score needs to become stronger. Three, so how does Victor go from a scientist to like a religious cult leader type guy? Well, we've already kind of crossed that threshold too. Think about how this all started. You had a vision? In that scene, we see the side of him that may tie in with science, but also stretches beyond strict logic. I think that's a foundation that they're going to build on a lot this season. Before we kind of talked about it a bit, in season one, we saw this reinitiation of a relationship with Singed, and we're going to see that grow. And number five, most mysterious, is that the Hexcore seems to have a will of its own and it wants to be used. So these are five little roads that our little Victor train is already chugging along, which all end in semi crazed science cult leader. And like I mentioned previously, his goal this season will be helping Zonite people. He'll need the Hexcore working at full capacity for that, he's going to be giving over more and more of himself to get it perfect. And the final step will be that ultimate form of the scene that we've seen with him over and over again, of him facing the decision to really give over all of himself and being consumed by it. Physically transforming, but also in terms of his identity becoming the Hexcore's new priest, the herald of the glorious evolution, a complete sacrifice of Victor. Which means, maybe, we're going to get this final tragic scene of him waking up as Lil Victor, hoping that everything worked and that people were saved, but unfortunately... It seems in your anger... You killed her. But yeah, I want to see the scene frame for frame, but just with Victor. With the no and everything. I'm just kidding. Actually, maybe not. Maybe I'm not kidding. Okay, next. Heimerdinger and Singed. So they've set up a history between these two. Love and legacy are the sacrifices we make for progress. It's why I parted ways with Heimerdinger. They've set up so many opposing parallels. I think Heimerdinger versus Singed has to happen in some capacity. Heimerdinger is now on the side of the ultimate present-oriented good guys. Singed has always been working so far in the future that he doesn't care about the present well-being of anyone at all. So they've never been more diametrically opposed. And I think both of these characters are going to be on the rise in this season. Singed was a side character in season one, and I could see him becoming a major antagonist in season two. Doing something like releasing a bunch of mutations on the street, making some new more dangerous shimmer technology, or he's doing some new grand experiment that will involve him experimenting on actual people of the city. And obviously the Echo Heimerdinger Alliance will now oppose that more than anything. And when I say battle, by the way, I would love to see like a Dumbledore versus Voldemort at the end of Harry Potter 5 S duel, but somehow I don't think that that's their style. So I think we'll see something more interesting than that. I have full confidence in the Arcane writers as always. And about Heimerdinger specifically, where he fits in in all this, he actually has a ton that's unresolved about him. First, we had his relationship with Jace. He was trying to be a mentor to Jace. Jace cast him out. Jace is likely going further down that exact road that 
that Heimerdinger cautioned him against. So I think we will see a climax for Heimerdinger involving Jace, specifically being the mentor he should have been and Jace confronting that. Sort of Anakin, Obi-Wan style. Second, very similar, his relationship with Piltover. This departure to Echo is him learning how to be of better service to his city, and that is still his goal. Will they accept him now that he knows how to serve them in a much better way? Very similar to what I'm saying with Jace, Jace accepting him will probably be representative of whether Piltover accepts him or not. And third thing, Heimerdinger is afraid of stuff. This caused him to make a lot of decisions in season one, but he never had to confront his fear itself. Whether that's through fighting or putting himself in the position of great sacrifice or potential danger, I don't know what that would mean for a Yordle. I think we're going to see an arc that's all about him facing his fearfulness. So the arc is going to be focused on that, culminating in a big scary sacrifice to prove his worth and his wisdom to Jace and to his city, with a confrontation with Singe along the way. Okay, Savika. My prediction is that Savika becomes the boss of the Undercity and then walks away from it, gives up power. So she's in a weird position to start out with. Personality-wise, she is not a leader. She's all about humble loyalty to the cause, she's the kingmaker, she is not the king she never has been. But also, she's sort of next in line, both starry side and audience side. Silco was the most powerful guy in the Undercity, she's Silco's number two, so she should get the spot. Especially since all the Ken Barons we met so far are kind of useless, they're kind of dopey. And audience side for us, she's the character we already have an attachment to. They could make someone new and then have to convince the audience that this person is scary and sinister enough to deserve the position. Easier to just give it to someone we already know is a ruthless badass. So that is kind of a strange place to be in for this character, but I think it's actually all kind of brought together by this cryptic Amanda Overton tweet. Hey Tris, thought you'd like to know that Vi doesn't smoke, and the only spoiler I'll give about season 2, Savika is also quitting. This is a huge milestone. So that's interesting. Smoking, as we know, is the symbol of Undercity leadership in Arcane. I made a short about this, it's a status symbol, luxurious breathing in an environment so oppressive that many people can't breathe at all. We see this symbol everywhere. Savika quitting smoking means that she rejects the whole institution of Undercity power. And there's only two ways I could see this happening. Either at the beginning of the season she takes power, but then she goes through a similar thing that Vander and Silco both did, where once she's in the position of leadership she sees that all-out war might not be the best option. There's too much at stake and nobody will come out on top. So at the crucial moment, she she just can't anymore. She sees clearly that this is not right, and she does the unthinkable, the George Washington, the Cincinnati. She walks away from power. Second way she quits smoking, which I think is also a possibility, is that there is a new Ken Baron. They're everything that Savika wanted in terms of being ruthless, etc. But then she has the same realization, the whole institution is hurting people, and she walks away from being a follower, unhenches herself from her henchwomanship, so to speak. Maybe allies with someone we wouldn't expect, that kind of thing. That's what I'm getting out of the Amanda tweet, but I don't know if I'm missing ways to go with interpreting it, so let me know what you guys think. Echo, sorry to disappoint, I'm at a total loss with Echo. Pretty much. I'm fairly certain he stays the third option. The scrappy punk whose faction doesn't really side with anyone, not Piltover, not Zahn, not completely with Vi, not with Jinx either. I'm definitely not on Team Echo Becomes the New Undercity Leader. That's just not who he is. He's with his own people and doesn't want to be involved in those bigger conflicts in those ways. Lore-wise, I mean, we know he makes his time-turner thingy, with Heimerdinger presumably. But it's like, what was his arc in Season 1? We saw it, but it felt like such a snippet. We barely know anything about his real inner conflict. I think it's gonna be more of a main character in the season, we'll see more of that, we'll get to know him more, but I gotta be honest with this one, just say I don't know with this character. What do you think? Please comment, I'd really like to hear. And finally, Ambessa, main villain? I don't think so. I think she's the herald for the new major villain from Noxus, and she's going to be flapping about in that infuriating Medarda zone where we can't quite figure her out. Which side is she on? What's she up to? But she's already mentioned this other Medarda killer. She's in Piltover trying to get weapons, presumably to fight this guy, and to try to get Piltover involved in this conflict with Noxus. Noxus is definitely being set up to play a bigger role in the season in some antagonistic fashion. Might start out as an alliance of some kind, but not going to stay that way. And we're going to see Mel trying to solve this as the new Mel, and then Ambessa trying to push for more wolfish ways of solving this, presumably war. And the arc, I mean, it's very clear what they left unresolved here. Mel and Ambessa's relationship, they left that shattered, basically. For Mel, it was this necessary step in building her own identity apart from her family. But for Ambessa, I think it's a sore point. She definitely cares about her family and about being big, bad war mommy. So that is what the show is going to make her choose between. My prediction, she dies in the season, sacrifices herself for Mel. I think that is the natural direction for a character. Okay, last major topic, new characters, new champions specifically. And I'm not a lore guy at all all, but I did some research, and we know we're in for a super messy season, filled with conflict, probably filled with trauma, and I think anyone who knows lore is already expecting this, there's only one champion who can really come in and just save the day. This is going to be a season about war, we need someone who can single-handedly make peace, world peace really. So it shouldn't be a surprise that season 2 act 3, with the power of love and joy and music, Arcane Show becomes the Seraphine Show. And there's music and peace, and everybody loves each other, and we have a dance party. 
Okay, no, my four predictions are Swain, Camille, Jin, and Renata Glask. And Warwick, obviously, but we talked about him already. And I don't have too much to say about these. Again, not a lore guy, just kind of dipped my toes into some research here. So first of all, Swain. I think a lot of season two is going to be about the relationship between Piltover and Noxus. And like we just talked about, we not only already see them getting involved through Ambessa, we already see the way that they would get involved, siding with one side to take advantage of the technology. In Ambessa's case, as we saw, it was Hextech, but I could just as easily see them going to Zaun also, making that alliance and getting Shimmer instead, or getting Shimmer also. But anyway, we see Arcane doing that setup, and we have this Medarda killer running around, some mysterious important guy that killed Mel's brother. From what I've seen, it seems like Swain could fit this role well. He's a Noxian leader. He would see Ambessa meddling, meddles the opposite way, joins the conflict in some way, and we end up with Piltover against Zaun and Noxus. And it's like up to Mel to use her new uniquely Mel way to save everyone. So loosely, that's my Swain prediction. Number two, Camille. If Jace goes all out Warhawk and stands against Mel, he's gonna need some new powerful ally in Piltover society. Someone with a similar zealous hardliner perspective, Camille seems to fit that role very well. She would embrace the tech in a different way from what we've seen, and she would really match the vibes of season two's Jace, who is now jaded and more egotistical than ever. And we also do get a brief mention of her family in season one, maybe that was foreshadowing. The House Pharaohs received your letter. They insist business is steady. So number three, Jin. I don't know. We we see his mask. Hard to say what kind of role this character plays. I think we'll get a character who we don't realize right away is him, and then we'll see the transformation. And I'm hoping that between Jinx and Warwick and Jin, at least, that means we're getting like an obscene amount of wild cards causing absolute chaos in this season, with our other characters just kind of trying to figure out how to get through their day. But yeah, hard to say anything more here. And then Miss Glask. I mean, whoever she is, it seems like they released her after season one to set her up for season two. So she does kind of fit into the two possible predictions I laid out with Savika. She could be Savika's Kembaran form, and then she eventually leaves that role but still goes rogue on her own. Or it could be the Kembaran that Savika sides with, that Savika chooses to follow. This is a long shot. I think it would be cool if it was like Savika's older sister or something like that. That might provide some more insight into her antagonism with Vi and Jinx, but might also lead to more understanding for her in that conflict. And then maybe she ends up siding with one of them because of it. I think that would be cool. Hard to say here. Okay, my questions that I dearly want answers to. So in that same interview from the beginning, they said this. It was exciting to get into it because of how much the ending of season one just turns everything upside down for every character. Uh, it's just been really fun to explore these new colors for all the characters. Um, you know, don't want to say too much, but... Um, new colors for these characters, that's definitely intriguing for me. What exactly are we going to see? So a lot of this video by design, because it's all we have, was based on what we know about the characters now. And even if there were some things we could say about how we expect them to transform, it's using such limited data compared to the writer's knowledge of the full story they intend to tell. So what are these new colors? What will these further developments and further nuances look like? Learning more about these characters that I love is almost definitely the thing I'm most excited for. Related, Singe's daughter is going to play a role in his development. I am at a total loss to speculate on this. What will Singe the father be like, and who is his daughter? I've seen a bit of Oriana speculation here. Can't say no much about that, but I'm totally open to it. Echo, as I said, big question mark for me, but I want to zoom in on the biggest blank here for me. So his time device, this kind of time travel is so hard to introduce in a way the audience accepts. There's kind of a general piece of advice with world building concepts that they should create conflict, not solve it. And rules can be broken of course, but time travel in general is always such a hand-wavy type of fantasy device. So often we're just meant to accept it, and that makes it, again, super difficult to introduce well. So how will you do it, Arcane Writers? Fourth, and this might be a small detail, but I was stumped on it, when exactly does Kate become Sheriff? I could see equal possibilities for the beginning, the middle, or the end. Beginning would mean that it's a primary source of conflict throughout her arc this season. Middle would make it a be careful what you wish for thing. And if it's at the end, it would sort of be a reward she earns by completing her arc. So how is this going to fit in? Aside from juggling her city and her girlfriend, this is kind of the main thing that I expect to fill out her arc, but I can't exactly figure out how. Very curious as to how they'll do that. And lastly, Noxus. So many questions. What role will Noxus play this season? Or will it even be part of the main arcs this season? Or will it be the start of the meta plot? Whatever that will be, I'm sure we'll see more building blocks in season two. I am very excited for that. So what do you think? If you agree with my predictions, which when I step back and look at it, basically is like saying half the cast is going to sacrifice themselves for theme, then please subscribe so that we can all cry together. And for anyone else who, like me, was a tad let down by the lack of any season 2 announcement or trailer or snapshots or anything on Wednesday at the Netflix thing, I was thinking about it, and I'm actually so happy that nothing was announced. A, this means that Fortiche is taking its time, which we all want. We don't just want to see season 2, we want to see season 2 of Arcane, the show that we all love because of how much care was put into every detail. And that's something that takes time, so Fortiche is taking its time, that is a good thing. B, equally great, Netflix is letting Fortiche take its time. 
this time, which is like the one thing that so often messes up these situations, even when you do have artists who are realistic about timing and scheduling and everything. Thank God the Netflix people are on the same page as the Fortiche people, so that is really a positive thing. And that making of series thing looks great too, great idea to tie this over for a bit. I'll be doing something with that on my channel, I haven't decided what yet. Patrons, thanks so much, especially Dane Bramage, new $10 supporter, Nub the Lame. And I'm going to be changing something up by the way. For those who don't know, I offer a little one hour writing consulting session for the $25 a month tier. And I originally intended it as like a one time thing and anyone who wanted to stick around could stick around for that tier, but if you didn't want to, you didn't have to. But I'm going to try changing it to once every month for all $25 patrons. And the one hour can be about writing, it can be about analysis, discussing fiction in general. I'm fairly open, so if anyone's interested, gonna try that. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun for me and hopefully helpful for all of you. Anyway, that's it for the video. See you in two weeks for another longer vid, some shorts between now and then, and thanks for watching.